begin. I'm Emily Gottlieb, the Education Director with the Western Flyer Foundation, and this is Chapter 18. Doc had driven slowly. It was late afternoon when he stopped in Ventura, so late, in fact, that when he stopped in Carpinteria, he only had a cheese sandwich and went to the toilet. Besides, he intended to get a good dinner in Los Angeles, and it was dark when he got there. He drove on through and stopped at a big chicken in the rough place he knew about. And there he had fried chicken, julienne potatoes, hot biscuits and honey, and a piece of pineapple pie and blue cheese. And here he, he filled his thermos bottle with hot coffee, had them make up six ham sandwiches, and bought two quarts of beer for breakfast. It was not so interesting driving at night. No dogs to see. Only the highway lighted up with his headlights. Doc sped up to, to finish the trip. It was about two o'clock when he got to La Jolla. He drove through the town and, and down to the cliff below which his tidal flat lay. There he stopped the car, ate a sandwich, drank some beer, turned out the lights and curled up in the seat to sleep. He didn't need a clock. He had been working in a tidal pattern so long that he could feel a tide change in his sleep. In the dawn he awakened, looked out through the windshield and saw that the water was already retreating down to the boundary Aldery flat. He drank some hot coffee, ate three sandwiches, and had a quart of beer. The tide goes out so impersibly. The boulders show and seem to rise up, and the ocean recedes, leaving little pools, leaving wet weeds and moss and sponge, iridescence, iridescence and brown and blue and china red. On the bottoms lie the incredible refuse of the sea, shells broken and chipped, and bits of skeleton, claws, the whole sea bottom a fantastic cemetery on which the living scamper and scramble. Dog, Doc pulled on his rubber boots and set his rain hat fussily. He took his buckets and jars and his crowbar and put his sandwiches in one pocket and his thermos, thermos bottle in another pocket, and he went down the cliff to the tidal flat. Then he worked down the flat after the retreating sea. He turned over the boulders with his crowbar, and now and then his hand darted quickly into the standing water and brought out a little angry squirming octopus, which blushed red and spat ink in his hand. Then he dropped it into a jar of seawater with the others, and usually the newcomer was so angry that it attacked its fellows. It was good hunting that day. He got 22 little octopi, and he picked off several hundred sea cradles and put them in his wooden bucket. As the tide moved out, he followed it while the morning came and the sun arose. The flat extended out 200 yards and there was a line of heavy weed crusted rock before it dropped off into deep water. Doc worked out to the barrier edge. He had about what he wanted now and the rest of the time, he looked under stones leaned down and peered into the tide pools with their brilliant mosaics and their scuttling, bubbling life. And he came at last to the outer barrier where the long leathery brown algae hung down into the water. Red starfish clustered on the rocks and the sea pulsed up and down against the barrier waiting to get in again. Between two weeded rocks on the barrier, Doc saw a flash of white under the water and then the floating weed covered it. He climbed over to the place he climbed to the place over the slippery rocks, held himself firmly and gently reached down and parted the brown algae. Then he grew rigid. A girl's face looked up at him, a pretty pale girl with dark hair. The eyes were open and clear and the face was firm and the hair washed gently about her head. The body was out of sight, caught in, in the crevice. The lips were slightly parted and the teeth showed on the face was just and the teeth showed, and on the face was only comfort and rest. Just underwater it was, and the clear water made it very beautiful. It seemed to Doc that he looked at it for many minutes, and the face burned into his picture memory. Very slowly he raised his hand and let the brown weed float, float back and cover the face. Doc's heart pounded deeply, and his throat felt tight. He picked up his bucket and his jars and his crowbar, and went slowly over the slippery rocks, rock, rocks back towards the beach. And the girl's face went ahead of him. He sat down on the beach in the coarse dry sand and pulled off his boots. In the jar, the little octopi were huddled up, each keeping as far as possible from the others. 
Music sounded in Doc's in Doc's ears, a high, thin, piercingly sweet flute carrying a melody he could never remember. And against this, a pounding surf-like woodwind section. The flute went up into regions beyond the hearing range, and even there, it carried its unbelievable melody. Loose pimples came out on Doc's arms. He shivered and his eyes were wet, the way they got in the focus of great beauty. The girl's eyes had been gray and clear, and the dark hair floated, drifted lightly over the face. The picture was set for all time. He sat there while the first little spout of water came over the reef, bringing the returning tide. He sat there hearing the music while the sea crept in again over the bouldery flat. His hand tapped out the rhythm and the terrifying flute played in his brain. The eyes were gray and the mouth smiled a little or seemed to catch its breath in ecstasy. A voice seemed to awaken him. A man stood over him. Been fishing? No, collecting. Well, what are them things? Baby octopi. You mean devil fish. I didn't know there was any. I've lived here all my life. You've got to look for them, said Doc listlessly. Say, said the man, aren't you feeling well? You look sick. The flute climbed again and plucked cellos sounded below the sea, and the sea crept in and in towards the beach. Doc shook off the music, shook off the face, stood, shook the chill out of his body. Is there a police station near? Up in town. Why? What's wrong? There's a body out on that reef. Where? Right out there, wedged between two rocks. A girl. Say, said the man. You get a bounty for finding a body. I forget how much. Doc stood up and gathered his equipment. Will you report it? I'm not feeling well. Give you a shock, did it? Is it bad? Rotten? Or eaten up? Doc turned away. You take the bounty, he said. I don't want it. He started toward the car. Only the tiniest piping of the flute sounded in his head.